Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from thousands of successful individuals from around the world. I am your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm delighted to welcome a very, very multifaceted professional personality from Mumbai, India, Kurshid N. Kurodi. Kur- Kurshid, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, Kurshid has been educated in England and graduated from Harvard. She's the chairman of Shivya Livelihoods Foundation. She sits on several social purpose and non-profit advisory boards. And she's a classical musician. She plays the piano, the cello and the violin. So uh, let me start by asking you, uh, Kurshid, after Harvard, what persuaded you to focus on the social sector? Well... You know, Ashutosh, life has a way of taking you where it wants to. Mm -hmm. And while at Harvard, I had my heart set on a life in academia Mm -hmm. back in the UK where I grew up, would Mm -hmm. have probably gone on and become a professor. I love life in in a university campus. Mm -hmm. Um, But tragedy struck. I lost my mother Um, here in India. They were abroad and they returned to India. Mm -hmm. My dad is a veteran Tata officer, Noshir Mm -hmm. Kurodi. Mm -hmm. taken over one of Tata's oldest companies, Walters. And I just felt that he needed uh, back office support, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Somebody, none of us were in the country. Mm -hmm. So I came to India. I found the city very challenging. I've grown up in rural England, in woodlands, on moors, Mm -hmm. with, you know, vast amounts of space around me. And I found the city and attitudes in the city stifling. Mm -hmm. And I traveled a lot to rural India in my early years in India. Mm. And I was, I met village folk, tribal folk, and I was really struck by the differences and the disparities Mm. and the astounding levels of poverty that this country still has, Mm. and more so how marginalized these people are. Mm. So I thought about it and I felt that this was my calling Mm. at that stage. And I also come from a family steeped in um, service. Mm. Uh, My grandfather, my father's father, Dara Karodi, built the RML colony, uh, won the Padma Bhushan and Mm. the Raymond Max Essay Award with Vergis Korean. Mm. and is known for milk for the millions wow. became the dairy development commissioner my mother's father doc uh, rustam karigat um was a doctor and surgeon in the british indian army mm. and served in the first world war in mesopotamia in mm. egypt mm. um and in palestine mm. and he retired as the chief medical officer and surgeon general of the federation of princes mm. and then became a trustee of the Pan- Parsi Panchat in Bombay. Mm-hmm. So it's mm-hmm. all been a life of service, service and service for mm-hmm. several generations. Mm-hmm. Justice Karigat, who left the legal profession because he fought capital punishment. Mm-hmm. His statue stands in Ratnagiri on my mother's side. My own parents, Norshir and Roshan Kurodi. So we've been brought up um, with this ethos from a very early age, and it seemed to be the right fit. Fascinating. And yes. given the fact that, you know, and we'll come to Shivya in a minute, but yes. let me ask you a more general question. What role does the social sector play in our country? Well, I think the social sector the world over, not just in India, mm. in short, is for overall human development, Mm. to reduce the imbalance of power we have and decentralize it. We have monetary power, uh, goods and services in the private sector. We have bureaucratic power in governments. What happens in the middle? Who fills in that gap um, where both the private sector and the government have failed in my opinion, is largely the last mile link. Mm. Who is going to fill that? Who is going to fight injustice, oppression, and corruption? Mm. Um, The social sector exists for change, change, and more change. Mm. And it's fast becoming an organized platform to deliver for human rights and development. Mm. Um, And I think that's what its role is Mm. and rightfully should be. Fascinating. So, uh, Kurshi, let's now move to talking a little bit about Shivya. You know, yes. you are the chairman of Shivya Livelihoods Foundation, which yes. is a foundation for peace and compassionate leadership. Uh, tell me about Shivya. 
Well, the Foundation for Peace and Compassionate Leadership is another organization. Okay. Uh, I sit on many NGO boards mm -hmm. and advisory boards. So that is a separate one mm -hmm. and basically focuses on generative dialogue mm -hmm. um, and works with decision makers, business people, executives, governments, mm -hmm. jurists, young people. That is the one foundation, um, well, one of two actually, which is now headquartered in India. Mm -hmm. I work with another one. I'll just give you a sort of uh, disparate um, dot around some mm -hmm. of the ones that I work with. Works with Wildlife mm -hmm. Ranger Lab, headquartered in the UK, started by a very enterprising young person called Lou Bedford. Mm -hmm. And we support rangers with their basic needs, personal mm -hmm. items and mm -hmm. equipment. So we work across Africa and India, and we're at the front line of conservation. So mm -hmm. again, it's the last mile link. And mm -hmm. that's headquartered in the UK. Shivya is also headquartered in the UK mm -hmm. and was founded by Olivia Donnelly. Mm -hmm. Very interesting young lady, with a background very similar to mine. Um, she's English and schooled and educated in England, took a year off, came to Calcutta to work with one of Mother Teresa's outfits, mm -hmm. stayed in rural Bengal for a year mm -hmm. uh, at an orphanage, loved it and decided that this was her life's work. Wow. Went back, graduated from Oxford, and her father said, um, you must, very similar to my father, get real work experience before floating any organization of your own. Mm -hmm. And she did that. And then Shivya was founded in 2009 mm -hmm. with its motto, Livelihoods with Dignity. And we serve the poorest of the poor in rural areas. Um, they also founded an implementing partner mm -hmm. on the ground in India um, so that work could take place at grassroots level. Mm -hmm. For a year or so, microfinance was the flavor of the day. Right. But um, Oli and her team soon discovered that all it does is really really put you um, back in debt. Mm -hmm. It increases your levels of debt. So they veered away from microfinance um, and decided to work directly from headquarters with grassroots. Mm -hmm. So the poultry program was born. Then the goat program was born. The agri-management program was born. Mm -hmm. And um, we've been on the ground ever since. And much more recently, um, we decided that we need to have float an organization a wing of Shivya in India. So we raise funds, not just from the UK, but in India, mm -hmm. for India. We also experiment. We want to see how we can grow. We want to scale. We have a large body of very sound knowledge capital. Mm -hmm. And we'd like to now take this out. It's what we know what's worked, what hasn't worked. Mm -hmm. And we'd like to take this out now and expand Pan India, particularly in parts of India that are forgotten. In, 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 the, in uh, the poverty corridors of India. Wow. In 2017, mm -hmm. I'll mention quickly here, Shivya won the International Charity of the Year Award, selected by the Charity Times in England. Mm -hmm. And this year, we won first prize in the, in the third sector awards in the UK, which is really competitive in a category called Small Charity, Big Impact. Mm -hmm. um, so it's done very, very well. And Shivya Livelihoods Foundation now have to pick up the threads and move move on to bigger and better things across India. Amazing. Together, of course, okay. with Shivya. Congratulations on such amazing recognition. Yes. I'm sure Shivya will go from strength to strength. Thank you. But, uh, you know, Kurshi, uh, now what have, you know, you've told me a lot about the things that you are doing in Shivya. Um as you look at your own role in the social sector, what have been some of your key learnings and some of your challenges? Um, the key learnings, I would say, have been find the right people. Mm. That is worth its weight in gold. It, it's mm. worth everything. Um, it also pays to persevere. It's all very well to say that People like me who work in the social sector have a great deal of passion, but mm. and, and that's very important, but it's not enough. Mm. It has to be backed by discipline, by detail, by structure, mm. by best practice, 
and by good governance. Mm -hmm. And it's very important, I've learned also to stay focused because one can forget the essence of the organization as one develops. Yeah. Um, yet you have to be brave enough to experiment and to embrace change. Mm -hmm. It's particularly now because we are living in a world that is moving so quickly. Mm -hmm. So we have to be like fish, a school of fish meandering in a river. Mm -hmm. And we have to be able to move as quickly as the currents take us with them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And as uh, an NGO leader, what in your opinion are some of the more important qualities uh, an NGO leader should have? The important qualities, faith. Um, faith that what you're doing will pan out, mm. hope, um, never lose hope because there are a lot of knocks in the NG NGO sector mm. that we all face um, that again, that this will pan out, never lose that sense of hope mm. and an unwavering desire to succeed, mm. discipline. This is also a very important quality when we select people to work with us, mm. trust that you empower someone and trust and let them get on with it. Mm -hmm. um, also trust the courage of your own conviction, mm -hmm. truthfulness, transparency, very important. The NGO sector relies on the narrative. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to be able to tell the story as it is. Mm -hmm. um, forthrightness, very important. Accountability, it's not our money. It's mm -hmm. the money of donors. So you have to be transparent and accountable. Mm -hmm. Compassion is a key quality. Humility is a key quality. Mm -hmm. And a perspective um, that all of us are fundamentally the same. Mm -hmm. Whether we're living in tribal India or in the city, whether we've graduated from Harvard Correct. or grown up on the land, we are fundamentally the same. When That's you realize that, you're able to work in a cohesive community. Mm -hmm. And I think also... Finding things that inspire you, uh, that make you yearn to want to ask more, learn more, ask questions, and the ability to tell stories and to be generous and never, never compromise on one's integrity. Mm -hmm. And also being a highly sensitive person and intuitive and able to sense way beyond what is apparent. Mm -hmm. um, someone with hugely developed sensibilities are not just fancy degrees, I think, fit fit the NGO world. Very interesting. Yeah. Now, my next question to you is regarding technology. Yeah. You know, the technology is now being used all over the world and it is really making serious changes in the way we do all our work. Yes. I'd love to get your perspective on how are you using technology and how is it changing the social sector? Well, the key driver for technology is convenience. Mm -hmm. um, and that leads to digital disruption. Mm -hmm. So when we look at convenience, the convenience that you and I might spell out and that farmers or poultry farmers mm -hmm. or women starting their first enterprise, mm -hmm. as in Shivya with the poultry program, uh, their um, convenience will be slightly different to ours, a different perspective. And in my opinion, not enough donors are putting money in specifically for software, for programs. Yet, I have to say that um, the technology has helped the NGO world with data mapping, mm -hmm. data sharing, data-driven inventions. Um, we are able to reach remote locations, generally for healthcare, for education, for jobs, mm -hmm. for social justice. Um, but if we have more investment in uh, technology specific to each NGO's needs, mm -hmm. um, we can multiply social impact. Mm -hmm. So we can improve more lives faster. Very interesting. Yeah. Uh, one more question about the social sector, and then I'll move to some questions for you personally. What, in your opinion, Kurshi, that some of the major social issues humanity faces today? Oh, my goodness. One would think we're in 2022 that the list would diminish, but it's grown. Yeah. Um, immigration, cultural and social Dem demographies have changed the world over and are changing. Mm. Um, therefore, peace and security, a conflict of powers, mm. aging and health. We've got an older population who are extremely capable and have a lifetime's worth of experience. How are we going to improve their quality of life and avail of what they have to offer? Mm. Environmental issues, of course, climate change, loss of biodiversity, and most important, the extinction of entire species 
energy, of course, mm. food and malnutrition, mm. hunger and water scarcity. This is going to become of prime importance mm. and a major social issue. The balance of between uh, man and machine mm. as AI takes over, what are people going to do? Right. A government and the private sector, my opinion on this is that they will probably work more in the third sector where I work. Mm. Uh, this can be human power is needed mm. in, in our sector. Gender equality. Goodness me, I graduated from uh, prestigious institutions, but I feel it mm. um, wow. uh, with uh, sitting on boards with you know, so many more men than women. Mm. Um, poverty alleviation. We have to crack this in the next 20 to 25 years. Correct. Human rights, law and justice, and I think also we're at a tipping point for so much, mm. like education. What do we mean by education? Mm. What is it going to empower you to do Correct. in this ever-changing world? These are some of the major social um, things that I would I would look at. Mm. Yeah, fascinating. And and each one of these is probably a discussion topic on its own. Yes, yes, yes. very meaty. Each well one. Said. Well said. Yeah. Let me now move to a few questions for you. Uh, Kurshid, uh, you know, you've been a Western classical musician. And as I said, and I was, when I was introducing you to the audience, you play the piano, the cello and the violin. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your life in Western classical music and how has this connected with everything that you are doing? Well, I was very fortunate because like many Parsis in my grandmother's home mm -hmm. every Saturday when I was living in India, a very small child, um, we, we went to one granny for lunch on a Saturday mm -hmm. and the other one on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. And one granny had a piano and all I'd do is try and figure out okay. tunes I'd heard mm -hmm. on the piano, forget playing with all the other grandchildren. Mm -hmm. That was secondary. So my mother started me... Um, with Western classical music very young, at the age of three, four, I think, I started to play the piano mm -hmm. and much more. And I play now in festivals all across the world. And my, uh, in a couple of master classes, I was told by more than one maestro to play the piano as though the instrument is a part of your body, mm -hmm. not something separate. Mm -hmm. So I learned from that, that life is what you are. It's not something separate outside of us. Mm. And very many of them have said, would you please play the piano with a bow arm? Mm. Now I don't play bowed instruments. Mm. So I couldn't understand what this thing is called a bow arm. Mm. So I started violin and cello mm. and I learned over the years, I wanted to pick one of the two and I couldn't decide. So I mm. played both mm. and I, I learned that the bow, the stick and the hair mm. on the instrument yeah. is an extension of your arm. Mm. Again, not something separate. Mm. So you start to learn about a oneness mm. and music rouses you to a higher consciousness. Correct. And we find a world much more convincing inside than outside. Mm. We also learn to listen, not just to hear. It's also the most abstract of all arts. Okay. So it's a wonderful way with which to approach life. Mm. And it's pure. Music doesn't lie. It's credible. Absolutely. It builds trust. It builds integrity. Melody and harmony. Melody moves the tune this mm. way. Harmony is vertical. So you learn to think in both horizontal and vertical at the same time. And eventually you learn to think in the round. Mm. You leave all of this behind. It's also highly complex. Um, the interweaving of highly disparate skills. Mm -hmm. It therefore builds competence and confidence. Mm -hmm. And it's a language and a conversation. It's a very powerful social tool. It brings people together. Okay. It also engages both hemispheres of the brain. It's an emotional trigger. It's We dance to music. It's about rhythm and beats. Correct. You can't live without your own heartbeat. Mm -hmm. um, it builds memory. It builds memories, mm -hmm. skills, discipline. Um, and eventually you reach a stage where the brain sort of operates in a state that we call unconscious competence. Mm. It builds imagination, devotion. It has mm. highly spiritual powers. And Beethoven said it's the mediator between the sensual world and the spiritual world. Mm. And it mirrors life. Mm. It's a paradigm for life. So every single music lesson, every single concert, every single masterclass brings you to another level 
And you reach a stage where you're able to incorporate that into your daily life. Mm -hmm. And I wish that all schools and states have music as a compulsory subject. I agree. And I, you know, this is such a fascinating response to my question because I play the the Indian flute and, Ah. you know, uh, as you were talking about everything that music does, I was able to relate with everything. Thank you for a great response. Um, so, Kurshid, now moving on, um, what would you say are three key milestones in your life or your career? I think starting Western music mm-hmm. and really uh, living deep inside the world of Western classical music, mm-hmm. um, moving to India, I realized that life isn't Oxford, Cambridge, and Harvard. Mm -hmm. I'm not living in an ivory tower anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, Traveling to rural India and realizing the many problems that humanity faces. And I think discovering, I started off purely in science and math. I love science and math. I would have would have become a doctor. Mm -hmm. But I discovered philosophy, poetry, Mm -hmm. um, and the humanities along the way. Mm -hmm. And it changed my life forever. The Socratic dialogues, uh, reading Aristotle, uh, and it just opened my mind to a much wider world. Mm. And I think also discovering nature, mm. sitting in, in a country like India with such beautiful beaches in Goa and the, the high Himalayas in Ladakh and realizing that we're nothing really, you know, we're just a, a tiny drop in the ocean. So yeah. getting a perspective on life. Mm-hmm. Um, so these are the three three or four um, learnings and milestones that have sort of changed the way in which I see life. Amazing. Yeah. And uh, moving on, you know, for someone who has achieved so much in life already, and there's so much more I'm sure you will in the future, what does success mean to Kurshid? You know, Ashutosh, this is such an interesting question. I spent a long time thinking about it. Mm. And then I realized that there really isn't anything like success and failure. Mm. It's all two sides of the same coin. Correct. There isn't, you really can't put things in buckets and say, well, um, you know, it's true that the learnings I've had, say, from the Katgari tribals, I live and work with, mm-hmm. say, in the hills of Kandala, that there is no them and there is no us. We're all the same. Mm-hmm. Um, this has been a successful learning. But it's, and failures as well, that it's really all part of one cycle. Mm-hmm. It's very difficult for me to put things in buckets because I don't see life mm-hmm. as a series of successes and failures, but mm-hmm. as one large experiential journey. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. And and, and a follow-up question of success is who or what inspires you? Um, Who or what inspires me? It's very easy. Mm. I think what inspires me without a shadow of doubt is um, great literature, Mm -hmm. um, a vast amount of poetry, um, certainly philosophy, um, and as I said, being with nature, mm. I think all of this, uh, the more the more you gain inspiration from the abstract, mm. the better for you, mm. uh, because you start to see a little bit of this in all human beings. Mm. So everything becomes an inspiration and the desire and the thirst and hunger to read more, to learn more grows as you discover more because mm. you keep feeling, am I missing out on more? Let me read it. And the whole thing becomes a tremendous inspiration. Life becomes an inspiration. Fascinating. So, Krishi, I have time for two more questions for you. My next question is on failure. I I even have a book written on failure because I've often said um, people in South Asia don't teach children it's okay to fail. Yeah. They're always told first in class and et cetera, et cetera. And that manifests itself in our behavior patterns. Yes. So, my question to you is, what have been some of your learnings from some of your mistakes? Um, oh, I make mistakes every day. I'm a master at mistakes um, <laughs> in everything I do. And uh, I mean, I'm going to use music as an example for this. Um, it is impossible when you're learning a piece of music to play it without mistakes. Mm. And every mistake in a piece of music, when you go back and look at it, is part of a bigger picture. 
Um, it's okay to say, well, I got the fingering wrong, or I, I had a memory slip, and I forgot this passage, or I lost track of the melody. Mm -hmm. But when you piece that into the jigsaw, the, the learning becomes, it's part of such a big picture that you actually blessed the failure. Um, and I find this uh, with my NGO life as well, that for example, there are a few NGOs that I thought I would be able to make a huge difference. And I struggled with the board because our perspectives were very different. Mm -hmm. And eventually I decided I need to leave. There's no impact. Uh, there's a lack of transparency. There are problems on mm -hmm. this board. Mm -hmm. But that again, bringing that back into my life, if one looks at that as failure, which as, as I said earlier, I don't really see it as a failure, but these are great learnings mm. uh, because you come away saying, I could run into this again. I work with so many people all across mm. the globe and I will handle it differently this time mm. because I need to make this work for the sake of our beneficiaries. My business is entirely about beneficiaries, mm. not about ourselves. Mm. So all of this is a, is a great learning. And all of these have been, in, if you'd like to say, mistakes in judgment that uh, this may work or that may work, maybe not having done enough due diligence mm. uh, joining those boards. But as I say, I look back and these are really rich learnings um, for, for the rest of my life. Absolutely. And to Thank share you. with others. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you for a, a wonderful response. And my last question to you, and this is for the many, many people who will listen to our conversation. Based on your amazing journey, um, what would you say, Khurshid, are three lessons or three learnings you would like to share with our viewers and listeners from them to take away from your own life and from our conversation? Um, I think the first would be you can't fight time. Okay. Time is our most precious commodity. Hmm. So prioritize and use it well. Yeah. I, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, if I didn't, we come into the world the same way. We leave the same way. Yeah, right. And all of us are essentially the same. It's a humbling thought. Absolutely. And all we have from start to finish is this thing called time, which is finite. So I think realizing that, um, that's a, a key lesson. Mm -hmm. And that defines how you lead your life. Mm -hmm. We're also the second, I, I learned this at Harvard, we're so busy achieving and doing mm -hmm. that we forget to just be. Mm -hmm. So I would say spend time alone with a quiet mind and find yourself. Yeah. In my life, I haven't had an option because music is such a solo career. Yeah. I've had to spend inordinate amounts of time on my own. Mm -hmm. And I work remotely with the UK. So again, I don't really have a, a lot of people around me here in India. So it's very important. You realize again that that's, that's um, a key driver in your life mm -hmm. when you've learned to be alone with yourself mm -hmm. and to care for your conscience and your soul as much or if not more as you do about other things that's it and mm -hmm. the third i would say is listen and experience life as it unfolds there really isn't need to seek to compete to search for anything outside of your own self Wonderful. And on that note, and your three amazing lessons, Kurshid, you can't fight time, use it well, spend time alone, try and find yourself. And the number three one is listen and uh, experience life. Thank you so much for speaking to me. Thank you for talking to me about your illustrious family. I mean, everyone in your family seems to have been, you know, achieved so much in life. Uh, and I can see you are going down the same path yourself. Thank you for talking to me about the issues of the social sector. I don't think I've ever heard someone articulate it so well. Thank you also for talking to me about music and your learnings. I think I've learned so many different things uh, music can do for each one of us. Thank you for talking to me about Shivya and all the amazing stuff that you are doing there. Thank you for speaking to me and good luck. And thank you so much for the time you've given me. Thank you very much and the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. 
just search for the brand called you